Okay, I think we'll get underway, Chris. We'll um, we'll just let people come in as they feel the need. It's uh, obviously a small group this morning. It's busy time. Everyone's realised with the hot weather that um, harvest is a lot closer than we thought and all the discussions we've had the last few days. But I'll just start off by thanking the GRDC for their investment in grain storage. It's obviously been a, a process for you, Chris, that you've been involved with for quite a while now and, and hopefully ongoing. Um We'll let the, the sort of people in the room dictate the direction of this. Chris has got a presentation and then we'll sort of flow through from that. So any questions you've got, feel free to jump on and, um, and ask away. Todd's already sent through an email um, and we'll cover that off as we go. Perfect. Thanks very much, uh, Matt. Um, as Matt said, Chris Warwick, uh, I'm based in Horsham in Victoria and I manage um, the GRDC's Grain Storage Extension Project. So I work with uh, Philip Burrell out of the north and Ben White in the west who also work as part of this project um, to, to help growers with their on-farm storage um, information needs. I'll share my screen uh, so that you can see the presentation. Um, as I said, if, if you guys have got questions uh, throughout the presentation, we've got a small group this morning, so that really allows us to keep this session interactive and ask you questions as we go. Um, so I welcome any questions. Please don't feel as though you're interrupting. The, the primary purpose I'm here is to answer your questions. So um, I'm, I'm more than happy to, to put the presentation aside and, and answer the questions that you've got this morning. Um, the topics I have got to cover um, that I've got listed there are um, how do we control insects, how do we prevent and then control uh, insects or weevils as many of you know them um, in grain storage, how do we manage high moisture grain given the forecast there might be a little bit around, what options have we got there um, and then how do we uh, manage temporary storage bags and bunkers if we need some overflow storage this year. Um, so that's the that's the, the base of what I've got to present this morning. But as I said, if if I'm I'm led by I'll be led by you guys as to what you really want to learn about this morning. Right now, starting with insect management, pest management. There's three real stages of pest management, um, to my understanding. And, and hopefully this makes sense to you as well. The first step is pest prevention, and it's the one that we often overlook. And in fact, it's actually the most critical in my mind. Um, it's always better to prevent a problem than have to deal with it once it comes along. So pest prevention is around hygiene and structural treatments, and I'll go through each of these in a bit more detail. Um, aeration cooling is about pest prevention as well as maintaining grain quality. Protectants. The spray-on products are also in the category of pest prevention. They're not designed to kill insects, they're designed to prevent them. And monitoring grain while it's in storage also comes under the banner of, of preventing issues in grain storage. Of course, then if we still do get insects, we need a way to control them. And on farm at the moment, uh, the go-to is phosphine. Grain quality then is, is really about managing moisture and temperature in the grain. Hygiene, what do I mean by hygiene? Uh, talking about cleaning up any spilt residue, uh, leftover grain around storages and also in, in, in uh, grain handling equipment and harvest equipment. So what research has, has told us is that insects primarily, they want shelter and they need a little bit of food. So anywhere on the farm that you can see that insects could shelter an overturned hopper, um, in, a, in a header, in an auger, or a chaser bin, a field bin that's empty, um, a, a silo that's empty. If there's a little bit of grain in there, they'll survive very happily uh, with a shelter. So getting rid of that grain. And, and when we get rid of the grain, remembering not to put it in a bucket and then sit in the shed because that then becomes a breeding ground. So we need to dispose that waste grain, feed it to livestock, bury it, burn it, sp even spread it out thinly across the ground so that it germinates. Then there's the follow-up after the clean-out is the structural treatment. Um, diatomaceous earth is a really neat product, um, such as dry side, that we can use uh, as a structural treatment, again, in the grain storages and in the grain handling equipment. So um, 
that's that's a, that's a really neat product. It's actually a natural product, so it's not chemical based. Um, so it's very safe to use. Um, you, you do want to use a dust mask and goggles, though, of course, when you're applying it. Um, one of the things I see, people put way too much in of this product. Um, you only need in 110, 112 tonne silo, as an example, you're looking at 420 grams, so really small amounts. You can put that in with a blowback gun, as pictured there, um, or you can use a leaf blower um, to, to get it into the silo. It, it's really, really quite a straightforward um, little process there. Just on that, yeah. Chris, um, how easy is that to get a hold of and that sort of thing? And where, where might you pick that up? Um, Thanks, locally? Matt. Great question. So it comes in a, a really odd sized bag. It's like a 7.8 kilo bag or something like that. And most of your, um, your retail stores like your Elders, your Nutrient Ag, uh, your CRT stores, they'll have um, the, the product on board. Um, it, it's, it's active, not an active. The mine product is a diatomaceous earth. Um, the dryer side brand has been uh, tested with superior efficacy. Um, so mm -hmm. I, I would be asking for, for that product. Um, and it works out, I actually did this recently, it works out at about three cents per tonne when used as a structural treatment. Mm -hmm. So uh, when you look at it and, and they say it's, you know, hundred and something dollars for the bag, be aware that that bag's going to go a fair way and it probably works out about three cents a tonne. So. Uh, certainly not cost prohibitive and, and it's it's mode of action is physical so the insects are not resistant to it they can't build up resistance to it but that's why it's a really neat product very interesting yeah uh, application wise um photo there on the left um open the top lid of the stylo once it's all cleaned out of course open the top lid open the manhole put your measured out amount into a bucket and then use your blow back gun or your leaf blood to um to, to scoot it up through the bottom of the silo it's so light and, and dust, dusty, it, it'll float up through the silo and then, of course, shut your lid and, and keep it dry in there. Um, the only proviso I would give there is you may want to rinse those storages if you're going to store pulses or oil seeds, just because those grains are, are so um, um, critical that the, the visual effect of those grains are, are not affected. I'd hate for one particular grain to get into your sample that, that might compromise. We've just got a question from Graham. Chris, we'll cross to him. He's got his, he's unmuted. Chris, can you I can, him? Graham, go for it. Um, it's just a technical question. It, does that product cause dehydration or how, how does it act on the insect? Great question. And you're on the right lines with the dehydration. So when you look at the diatomaceous earth under a microscope, it's actually very sharp, very abrasive. And so it scratches the waxy cuticle on the insect, and yes, then they dehydrate. And that's why it's a physical mode of action, so they can't build resistance. I do hear some growers say, it looks a lot like lime. Can I just use lime? Um, and, and we've actually tested that the lime the efficacy of the lime is, is not the same. And that's because when you put the two products, the diatomaceous earth and lime under a microscope, they do look quite different. That There's not that abrasive effect. So, yep, right, spot on, Graham. Um, aeration, I said, was part of pest prevention. So good thing to understand is that we're not trying to kill insects with aeration cooling. We're actually trying to prevent them. And we do that by um, making the grain cool uh, and, and providing an unattractive environment for insects in the first place. But secondly, if there are insects in there, the colder we get it, the slower their reproductive cycle. So to the point where we can actually stop them reproducing if we get the, the grain cool enough. So one of the, the common ones, a rice weevil there, we actually have to get the grain down to 15 degrees, which is very possible um, with aeration cooling and a controller. But the other common ones, lesser grain more, a rust ridge flower beetle, um, even 18 to 20 degrees, we can stop them reproducing. Um, so that's, that's what we're trying to do with aeration cooling, and that's very possible. Um, through the testing that's been done, we can we can achieve that. Um, of course, aeration cooling helps us with with our, our grain quality as well. Uh, and, and look, even if we if we don't have aeration controller to get these temperatures, even if we get it down from those harvest temperatures mid mid thirty degrees, where insects can reproduce in about four weeks, their life cycle is very fast. 
if we can get the temperature down to even mid 20 degrees, their insect, the insect life cycle goes from sort of four weeks right out to 10 to 12 weeks. So we really slow their reproduction down and, and slow their, their activity down. To give you some idea on, on what grain typically would do once you put it into storage, the, the orange line here at the top, that's grain gone into storage in, in about mid 30 degrees. And you can see from December right through to February, it maintains that temperature. Grain is a really good insulator. Compare that to grain, uh, the same grain that's gone in at, at mid, even a bit higher than mid 30 degrees with aeration cooling, a couple of weeks, they've taken off sort of 10 to 12 degrees off that, that grain temperature. And then over the next month, really brought it down to 20 degrees right through summer. They've, they've kept the grain cool. And then once they get into autumn, they're looking at below 20 degrees. So that's what's possible with aeration cooling. So even if we put grain into, into storage and think the ambient temperature's cooled down, that grain bulk will hold its temperature uh, for a long time. And that's worth remembering, particularly when we're doing temporary storages, bags and bunkers, expect that grain bulk to hold the temperature for quite a few months. Protectants, um, the, the second last part of um, of insect prevention. Um, the, the most important thing to understand about protectants, the spray and products now, they are just that. They're a protectant. They're not designed to kill live adults and they won't do it reliably. So if, we, if we're going to use protectants, we need to use them before we've got an issue. Um, so typically at harvest, we'll spray them onto the, onto the grain. Um, well suited to non-gas type storage where we can't use a uh, fumigant. Um, typically three to nine months uh, protection and even coverage is absolutely critical for protectants. That's the number one thing that we've got to get right, um, accurate and even coverage to the grain. A little bit background detail on protectants. We'll think grain storage pests, they're weevils, right? They're, they're all weevils. Um, to a degree, yes, there's a number of weevils. Uh, and there's five really main ones that we see uh, around the country. And, and so same as your, your insecticides that you would apply in the paddock, you've got to select the right insecticide for the right, right pest. So because it's a protectant, we don't know which pest we're going to get. Our aim, of course, is to try and pick a protectant that gives us the, the best broad spectrum sort of a, a prevention control. Do you find, Chris, uh, more regionally specific or is it more um, crop type specific where you find different different insects? Not, not typically regionally specific until you get up into Queensland and they might have uh, more of the brookids and, and those sorts of things that, uh, that might get into mung beans uh, and those pulses they grow up there. But typically we haven't seen a regionally specific trend in, in insects. Um, the only thing we have seen is that they'll live from one season to the next if hygiene is not done well. So if you've got rice weevil on your farm this year and you don't do hygiene well, fair chance the rice weevil will be around for you again next year. Mm -hmm. um, but these insects can fly with the wind. They can move around. So there's nothing to say that you won't get them from the neighbour as well. So um, a broad spectrum sort of a approach for protectants is, gives you the best chance. Um, the two products that will give you the, the, the broader spectrum control is the Kaobile uh, or the Conserve Plus, the top two in this table. You can see they'll pick up most things. The Socket is less common, so I'm, I'm less worried about the Socket. It's the, the, the first five of the main ones. Um, those two products will give you the, the, the best coverage for, for four of the five main, main pests. Of course, the rice wool you can see there is, is not controlled. And that's why we need to either add Reldan or Phenitrothine to the mix uh, to, to control against the rice weevil. So it's not that complex. The thing to remember, same as your herbicides, your fungicides, uh, insecticides in the paddock, we want to rotate chemistry. So using Kaobol one or two years and then conserve plus for one or two years, rotate the chemistry um, to keep those products alive for, for longer. A little decision tree, it's a, it's a lot on this page, but I'll break it down and simplify it for you. The Conserve Plus or Kaobile, whatever your choice might be to control those top four insects. 
to give us protection against the rice weevil, we need to mix either phenytrethine or reldan. Which one do we choose there? Uh, if it's malt barley, uh, we need to use phenytrethine. We can't use reldan and malt barley. Um, phenytrethine is also applicable for rice, maize, wheat, uh, feed barley, oats, sorghum and millets. Um, then we make the choice with the phenytrethine of do we want three months protection or nine months protection? And that will determine our rate that we apply the, the product. It also determines our withholding period. You can see right down the bottom, if we apply for not just on at the high rate, there's a, a 90 day withholding period, something to be, to be mindful of. Graham, you've got a question there. Yeah, Chris, um, my question relates to uh, resistance and managing resistance. Um, in, in other parts of science, we see that sometimes mixing active ingredients is a really way, a great way of trying to extend product life. Um, has there been any work in this space that, that considers that or are you just recommending the rotation of actives? Great question. There's, uh, there's certainly other products out there that have been chemistries that have been available for a longer and uh, they are certainly under a lot of pressure for resistance to the point where I don't bother putting them in that table that I just showed you um, for that exact reason, uh, to the point where we don't even recommend mixing them, putting them in the mix anymore. Um, their effectiveness is, is that low. And so the, the, main, the two main things to, to keep these products working for as long as we can is rotate the chemistry and put the right application rate on. Uh, so some people might think, well, uh, I can only apply these products once to a parcel of grain. Maybe I'll put a, a lower rate and put it, put it on twice. No, we, we want the label rate. We want it applied once uh, and we want really even coverage. The other things we can do, of course, is use protectant in combination with good hygiene, structural treatments, aeration, cooling, so that we give the chemistry the best chance of working. If you, again, I'll, I'll relate it back to the, in, the, in the paddock chemistry, when we, when we put a herbicide on to, to, to control weeds, we don't just tip the herbicide in the tank and expect that's magic. We get the water rate right. We get the droplet size right. We do it in the right weather conditions. So we do everything we can to give the chemistry the best chance of working. Same with the protectants in grain storage. We want an even coverage. We want the right rate the dose rate, we want the right products mixed together to give ourselves a best best chance of a good control. And that in turn will prevent the resistance building. Does that answer the question? He's just muted his microphone, but I think, yeah, that's yeah, covered. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Chris. Uh, no worries. That's a good, good just question. On, just on that too, Chris, in terms of the practical application, um, are you seeing guys going more to a nozzle uh, actual application uh, in into the auger or are people still just using the dribble method or what what's the um what's best practice nowadays yeah great question matt the the ideal is uh actually two nozzles into the auger flight itself so uh spaced about two meters apart uh, one to two meters apart uh two 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 nozzles um so that you can actually re regulate the flow into the auger accurately the old just dripping it onto the flow as it's in the hopper does not give you even coverage. Uh, that's been proven. So it, it doesn't give you even coverage there. Uh, so a, a spray into the into the auger flighting itself and ideally two nozzles um, is the ideal way to go. Yeah, we've just purchased one of those auger shoots, the zigzag auger shoots that we use for actually treating grain going yes. for seed. Um, I think this would work both ways. Yeah, yeah, and certainly if you've got a, a tube veil or a belt, belt shifter that you don't get the mixing, um, then you've got to use one of those zigzag heads for sure. Um, you, you need some sort of grain mixing there. Um, and the other downside is you, you don't want to be spraying a protectant onto a tube veil or, or a belt conveyor because it can wet the belt and then the belt starts slipping. So, again, an, another need for those zigzag heads is, is certainly another way to do it. Um, I started talking about Reldan as your other mixing option with your conserved plus or Um 
Uh, be aware that Breldan is not accepted by some international markets. So if your grain is destined for export, you, you may choose not to use Reldan. It's always a good idea to check with your intended grain buyer before you, before you use any protectants. Um, some buyers prefer not to have any protectants on them. Um, but the, the beauty of Reldan, if it's a domestic market, um, there's no withholding period. So uh, that, that's the upside for, for Reldan. Of course, um, always follow the label directions. Um, they, they will guide you to, to what you can and can't do. And again, check with your intended uh, grain buyer. Monitoring, the last part of, of pest prevention is around monitoring. Um, to me, that's easiest done with a probe trap. Uh, and the top left picture here, you've got a, a photo of a probe trap, um, which can be placed in the grain and then pulled out once a month to check if there's any insects in there. Um, or a sieve, the bottom left picture there, to sieve a sample of grain from the top or the bottom of the silo. The other thing that's worth keeping an eye on is grain temperature. Um, I've spoken a bit about that already, but that could be a, a nice temperature sphere or it could be as simple as a, a little digital uh, temperature um, readout that, that you can actually cable tie in the top of the silo. Anything you do leave in the silo for, for monitoring, tie it off inside the silo so that it doesn't end up in the grain if you forget and, and outload um, before removing it. Mm -hmm. But uh, monitoring, keeping records and writing down any treatments you've done to that parcel of grain helps you fill out the commodity vendor deck and, and know what's going on before you get any of those nasty surprises at outturning. Okay, so what happens if we've done everything we can to prevent pests, but for one reason or another, we've still got insects in there. The, the go-to, as I said earlier, uh, is phosphine. And that's because the other fumigants, uh, you need to be a licensed fumigator to, to use them. So fumigation is the one we have access to. The thing to understand about phosphine is that we need to kill all parts of the insect life cycle, not just the adult insects. To do that, we need the phosphine to be at 300 parts per million for seven days. Or if the grain is cooler, the grain is under 25 degrees, we actually need that phosphine there at 200 parts per million for 10 days, so a bit longer. There's a pretty simple reason for why we need that, that concentration for that time. In the, in the insect life cycle, the adult and the larvae are, are reasonably active, so they take the phosphine in and that'll control them. The egg and the pupae are quite dormant, so they won't take the phosphine in. So what we need to do is hold the phosphine there long enough that the egg and the pupae start developing to the next phase of the life cycle, and then they'll take the phosphine in. So if you hear people talking about, I'll just add more phosphine, I'll just increase the dose or do those silly things that we hear about, uh, it's not going to make any difference uh, to, to those eggs and those pupae because they're not active, they're not taking the phosphine in. So we need to, we need to hold the right dose of phosphine there for the right amount of time. Um, to, to give you an idea of, of how we might do that, obviously we don't expect, the idea would, would be to have um, gas monitoring lines inside every silo, but commercial reality is that we don't. That's where the pressure test comes into to its own. So if we have silos that we can do a pressure test on, they pass a, a three minute half-life pressure test as a minimum. This graph shows the gas concentrations we can expect in a silo that passes a half-life pressure test. And I can demonstrate a pressure test if, if you'd like at the end. Um, the three lines here are the gas concentrations inside the silo at the bottom, the middle and the top. A red line here is our target, 300 parts per million. You can see in this gas type solo, we've well and truly achieved those, those gas lines, gas levels, sorry. Compare that to a solo. This was actually the same solo. The seal was slightly compromised. We still could do a pressure test, but it only passed an eight second half-life. So not the full three minutes. And you can see the gas levels there, the green and the yellow line didn't even reach our target of 300 parts per million. And even at the top of the silo, we didn't reach our target concentration for our seven to 10 days. We only, only got up there for about five days. So that's why we talk so much about gas type storage um, and that unsealable storage is not suitable for fumigation. 
Of course, every time we do use phosphine in an unsealed storage, uh, in attempt to try and kill a few adult insects, we breed resistance. We, Graham asked about resistance with protectants. Well, resistance with phosphine is a really big issue, and that's why, because we're doing um, we're doing fumigations in unsealed storages. Eggs larvae pupae are surviving those fumigations, and so they are now breeding on with an added level of resistance or selecting for resistance. How do we apply phosphine? Um, there's bag chains on, on the left. They're a nice, safe, easy way to, to put the phosphine in or the typical tablets in trays uh, in the headspace of, of the grain. We certainly don't want to mix phosphine in with the grain. Um, we need to be able to remove the residue once those tablets have liberated at the end of our fumigation period. For bigger flat bottom silos, uh, a recirculation system will get the phosphine concentration through the silo uh, and quicker than it will just dispersing naturally. So uh, a, a sealed recirculation unit is, is ideal in a bigger flat bottom silo. So that's, that's insect control, the nuts and bolts of it. Um, given the time today, I haven't gone into too much detail on them, but hopefully given you enough information so that you're aware of what's involved and um, and then next time we can go into more detail about uh, how do we actually manage that aeration, uh, how do we, we, we actually apply those protectants. Going now into managing high moisture grain, if we do find ourselves wanting to, to take grain off at a bit higher moisture, whether that be early harvest or um, start a bit earlier in the day, do a few more hours each day um, or get into grain after a weather event. There's five main options really for, for dealing with high, high moisture grain and they are blending. So blending wet grain with dry grain, a pretty simple process. We can actually hold high moisture grain with aeration cooling until such time as, as we can blend it or dry it. So we can hold grain with aeration cooling. We can, of course, do aeration drying to dry the grain down. Or well, there's two types of dryers, a continuous flow dryer or a batch dryer. What am I talking about with blending? We can, we can put grain into storage or into a truck, co-mingle it, um, running two augers at once and give us a good blend of, of um, over and under moisture grain. That's pretty simple math. So if, if your target's 12%, You've got half your grain at 14% and half your grain at 10%. Your, your simple mass is that your average will be 12% there, providing you've blended it evenly. The other way to, to do blending, uh, and it's a much safer way to do it, um, and more typical is you'll put um, some wet grain, some dry grain, layer it in a, in a storage, and then use your aeration cooling to even out those grain moisture and grain temperature. So aeration cooling can help even them out. It won't dry the grain because it can't carry the moisture through the grain bulk and out the top, but it can carry the moisture from one grain to the next. The, the image on the right there, the little diagram, putting dry grain and then a heap of wet grain on top is not blending. It's not going to, to get your moisture migration as you need. I so said you can hold grain um, slightly over moisture um, so sort of 14 to 15% for two to three months with aeration cooling. You need to run those cooling fans continuously uh, unless the, the ambient relative humidity is over 85%. Uh, and of course, if we've got aeration fans running, we need ventilation at the top to let that air escape. Um, over, over moist grain will actually cool really well, a bit like an evaporative cooler effect. You've got... Um, most likely dry air going over damp grain um, will get a really good cooling effect. So what you're doing is cooling that grain down so that it prevents mould from growing until you can do something with it. Uh, aeration drying. So I've talked a bit about aeration cooling. What's the difference between cooling and drying? Aeration cooling, we're talking about two to four litres of air per second per tonne. So very small airflow. Drying, we need 15 to 25 litres of air per second per tonne. So quite a bit more airflow. And that's simply to be able to carry the moisture 
from one grain at the bottom of the silo all the way past the other grains and out the top. It's simple physics of, of you need more air to carry that grain out. If you don't have the airflow, you'll start moving or if you try and you know, maybe double your aeration cooling flow rates and you, maybe you've got eight to 10 litres of air per second per tonne, what you'll find is you carry the moisture from the grains at the bottom of the silo, you'll carry it part way up the silo, but it won't be able to carry that moisture right out the top. And so you'll end up with dry grain at the bottom, very wet grain in the middle somewhere, there'll be a, a stalled um, drying front, they call it, and then the, the grain at the top of the silo won't, won't be affected at all and it'll still be over moisture. So high airflow is absolute key for aeration drying. Selecting the right air for drying. Look, I put this table here to let you know that these sorts of um, resources are available on storedgrain.com.au. So if, if aeration drying is something that you're interested in, in having a go at um, and running the fans manually, obviously the automatic controllers do a brilliant job. If you're wanting to try and operate the fans manually and you're wondering what temperature and relative humidity should I put as my set points, these sorts of tables are available on the storedgrain.com.au website. Uh, batch dryers, you, you may have seen these come out of um, a couple of supplies out of Toowoomba. Typically looking at removing 3% moisture content from about 8 to 10 tonne of grain per hour. So that's your typical um, sort of capacity for a batch dryer. Um, continuous flow dryers can come in all, all shapes and sizes in terms of uh, capacity, but typically 3% from 10 to anywhere up to 37 tonne per hour. So certainly much higher throughput, um, but of course they're not portable. You need to set them up at your, your dedicated facility. So for majority of people, um, looking at, at drying, uh, or sorry, looking at managing high moisture grain, the, often the most cost effective way to do that is actually just through blending. So storing some low moisture grain when you get some, um, to be able to blend that with your slightly over moist grain um, is certainly the most economical way to deal with high moisture grain. And having some aeration cooling to hold any over moisture grain uh, until you can have time to blend it. Um, certainly the, the most economic and, and, uh, and, and most efficient way to, to deal with that over moisture grain. Key points uh, from, from what's covered so far, pest control really starts with prevention. Um, I, I can't emphasise that enough. That the ideal is to prevent the pest in the first place and, and, and not have an issue to deal with. If we do need to control pests, Phosphine is the only reliable uh, in gas type storage. So we need to make sure we've got gas type storage. Um, those multiple ways to deal with over moist grain that I've spoken about, um, most common is, is the, the blending option there, unless you really want to get into to grain drying and set up with aeration drying or dedicated drying machines. Grow notes uh, is available from the GLAC or the stored grain website. It's also available in hard copy. If you'd like a hard copy, we can send one out to you. That includes everything we've been through today and, and more. It's, it's really a, uh, an all-encompassing manual on on-farm storage um, or the stored grain website, which I mentioned. Um, and if you do have questions after today, there's a, there's a hotline there, a support line, 1800 Weevil, and that will put you in touch with either Philip, myself or Ben um, to be able to answer your questions directly. I've got more on uh, temporary storage. I'm aware that we're at our half an hour limit that we'd set aside for the webinar. So I'll be led by you guys. If you'd like me to continue on in temporary storage, I can. If you do need to go to other things, then uh, I absolutely understand as well. I think Todd, you were pretty keen to talk about silo bags and, and your experience and Graham, anything you would like to cover? Yeah, I think um, Matt, the the conversations that farmers have been having this year is about um you know local storage being filled and how much on farm temporary storage they might have to to um you know institute so it probably lines up with what todd wanted to talk about as well 
Definitely. Todd sort of had a, a crop specific um, question, but I think covering off on, on temporary storage would, would cover that as well. We spoke about oats and Todd, if you can unmute yourself for you, you were talking about oats in a silo bag and how they store. Were they matikas like a milling oat or were they a, a feed oat? Yeah. Hey guys. Um, it's a matika oat. I just heard there was a few issues with oats silo bags. That's all. What sort of issues were they? Were you, have you heard about, Todd? Um, just my father was talking about it. I, I haven't had, I don't know much about it, but I just heard there was some issues with oats and um, pest problems in the silo bags, but that's all I've heard. I just thought yeah, I'd sure. ask and knock it on the head. Yeah, good, good question. Um, my suspicion is oats are, um, barley and oats, are typically the first grains to to come under pressure from insects. Um, they, they tend to be able to, to get into them much easier. Uh, then it goes to wheat and then legumes typically are, are not as much of an insect issue. Um, so regardless of the storage type, oats, oats and barley are often attacked by insects first and, and, and most prolific. prolific. Uh, so when you put oats into a bag, of, of course, you've got to take that into more, in, into uh, consideration. Given our insect control options in bags is, is more limited, to me, it puts more emphasis on doing the setup and the preparation even better. So um, making sure our hygiene, when we're filling bags, we don't leave grain around the bag that's going to attract insects to that bag site. Um, making sure that obviously not just insects, but rodents, birds, mice, foxes, sheep, um, wildlife, anything that's going to put a hole in the bag then exposes the bag to insects as well, and of course, as well as moisture. So doing the preparation, having a nice graded flat pad so that we can clean up after, our, um, after we've filled the bags, that gives us our best chance of preventing the insects. You can use protectants in bags. Um, you need to find a way for application. It's likely you'd have to set up an auger to do it. So not as easy as the old chaser bin from the header across to the corner of the paddock. Um, but protectants would be an option in bags. We're not aware of aeration cooling possibilities in bags. So that's a limitation. You're likely to have grain at high harvest temperatures, which insects can breed quite quickly in. Um, there has been some limited research on uh, fumigation in bags, so that is possible. Um, and again, that store grain website has got some instructions on how to do that. Um, or the commercial fumigators can fumigate in a bag provided it's, it's in good condition and, and being maintained. The, the difficult, the most difficult part of fumigating in bags is actually the ventilation. So removing the phosphine after the fumigation, that requires a, a fan sucking the air through the bag from one end to the other. That takes a little while, it takes longer than what the label actually tells you uh, the ventilation period is um, for a typical fumigation in a silo. Of course, the other thing we can do is make sure that the grain going into bag, the bag is dry if we've got the option, we don't want to put anything that's, that's over moist, uh, over moisture limit of 12, 12.5%. So the drier we can put the grain in, if we get the option, the cooler we can put the grain into the bag, uh, the less attractive it is for insects as well. Um, I'd also suggest, I know it's convenient to put a bag in the corner of each paddock as you're harvesting. That, that's, that's the ideal from a harvest logistics perspective. From a uh, grain storage perspective, having your bags all together at a central site or a few central sites around the farm makes management a whole lot easier. Um, and, and you'll tend to find that you'll be able to monitor and manage those bags a lot more frequently than if you've got them spread all around the farm. You, you'll tend to neglect the, the weekly checking um, to be able to patch holes and, and, and fence them off and get rid of vermin as, as soon as they uh, appear. Uh, and that all goes towards preventing insects and preventing bigger issues with bags. Uh, I've spoken a bit about this already. The site selection really is important for bags. Um, it, it can determine the difference between a, a good result and a, a disastrous result. So central, all weather access, sloping ground, 
um, compacted surface is really important. If we put a bag on soft ground, the weight of the grain will sink the bag into the ground. Any bit of rain then will, of course, run off the bag and then down under the bag into that sunken ground. If there is a hole underneath for a mouse, then your grain is sitting in a pool of water. So compacted surface is, is really important. Free of sticks and sharp, sharp rocks, of course. Uh, ideally away from uh, trees or sand hills where you typically see birds or rabbits or vermin. Um, that, that, they're the ideal sort of some site selections. Picking a quality bag, they, are, they have improved a lot in recent years from when they first come into Australia. The simplest is the old thumb test. <laughs> go, when, when we can go to field days again, walk around the field days and actually try and poke your thumb through the bag uh, is as good as any way to actually tell um, whether you're buying a quality bag. Some of them, you can, you can feel that they're, they're thinner than others. Anecdotally, people suggest sprinkling a bit of urea on the ground under where you're going to put the bag, stops the mice. We don't have research on that, but that's, a, um, that's something we've learned from, from grower experience. Sealing the bag where you start, at the starting end with a nice square end, um, helps you, you keep the bag straight. And we've found that keeping the bag straight means there's less creases and the creases are where the mice and, and vermin will attack first. So the less creases you can get in the bag, the less places you've got for that bag to be attacked. So it's not just about uh, looking good, it's about getting keeping vermin out as well, keeping, keeping them straight. Obviously the correct stretch uh, and running them downhill so that water can run away from them. And then sealing off the, the, the end of the bag with a nice square end again and, and even covering it with dirt to make sure it is well sealed. Graham, you've got a question. Yeah, Chris, my question is in relation to the urea under bags. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not sure what that would actually do, apart from one possibility is if you put down a reasonably high urea rate, hydrolysis will um, result in a very high pH and mm -hmm. you'll get... Um, the ammonium being given off as ammonia gas and mm -hmm. the ammonia gas is very toxic mm -hmm. um, to mice. So okay. um, I'm just trying to think technically <clears throat> how that might have worked, but do you mm -hmm. know anything about how that might act on mice? I don't, I don't, Graham, and I was reluctant to include it in, in these presentations until I heard a lot of growers, significant number of growers, telling me they do it and they found that it works. Mm -hmm. um, but put the, put that uh, little proviso in there that we haven't done research on it to know yeah. how it works, if it does work, and why. So that's certainly something we'd love to look at in the future. Does it actually work? And if so, how and how much, as you said, how much you have to put in, and are there any risks to doing it? Um, obviously, we're assuming the bag is is sealed and the urea is not coming into contact with the grain that's a, that's a given um but how and why we, we don't know it, it's anecdotal at this stage yep yep okay so i was just trying to understand how that might practically work and look um my hunch is that it's probably the ammonia which would mean you have to put it out under the bag at a reasonable rate yes um because what you want to do is, is say on an acid soil, um, the urea hydrolysis process will raise the pH and it can rise, raise it to eight and nine, right? You yeah, okay. Down, you can be down at four and a half and you can, depending on how much you add, you can raise it quite high. The pH governs um, the equilibrium between ammonium and ammonia. And the okay. higher the pH, the more... Um, of that proportion that is stored as ammonia. And of course, okay. ammonia itself can be, can be very toxic. Um, yeah. So that's a possibility anyway, just a thought bubble. Yeah. That'd be, it'd be interesting to have a look at and see if and how it do, actually does work. Um, as you say, how much would you actually have to put on to get that, that effect happening? So yeah, thank you for that. Good point. Uh, after filling the bag, of course, uh, we 
want to fence the site off to keep not only our own sheep but the neighbour's sheep out and vermin, um, set up bait stations for mice, as I said earlier, clean up any spills and remove them from the site. Um, it, it's, it's about keeping all vermin away. That in, in, in turn will prevent holes in the bag, which prevents moisture getting in and prevents insects getting in as well. So that, all of those reasons is why I want to, to manage bags well. Regular monitoring, as I've said, um, depending on the pressure that those bags are under at least weekly. Um, taking a sample of, of grain uh, monthly um, to check moisture and temperature and insects, um, making sure water is draining away and, and topping up those bait stations. Bunkers, uh, if anyone's interested, bunkers are a bit the same in bags in that the majority of your success comes from your preparation and your site selection. So picking an elevated site where you've got good drainage, compacted ground, a graded slope, and even a graded camber um, to keep the water away from that stack of grain. Uh, thinking about a bunker wall, I'd, obviously the, the higher you can get a bunker wall, the more capacity you've got. It can also help in keeping the moisture out, um, but your choices there uh, are obvious. You can start with a, an earth wall, um, a corrugated wall like, like pictured here, or the ideal is a concrete wall with clamps to actually hold the bunker tarp down securely and, and seal it off if you do need to fumigate in the bunker. Um, a bottom tarp is ideal. The top tarp sealed down like it is in this, this image uh, to the, the concrete wall. Um, selecting a quality tarp, like a, a quality bag, selecting a quality tarp is also important. Um, not only the integrity of the grain, but also, if, again, if you do need to fumigate, you, you can actually get a seal there. Something to think about for bunkers is a safe method to remove the tarp. And, and to put the tarp back on again. Um, I've seen a few different methods, some safer than others, but it's something worth thinking about, actually a, a method to, to remove these tarps safely, particularly if there's a, a breath of wind comes up unexpected. Um, you hear some horror stories, people hanging on tarps that are blowing away. It, it's, it, it can be quite a dangerous operation. So having a safe method to do it, I do hear about people using bunkers, um, saying that as soon as the bunkers open, you really want to empty the whole bunker. You don't want to be closing it up, opening it up, taking a truckload or two out, then closing it again. You really want to open it up and, 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 and empty the bunker. Same as bags, again, cleaning up any spills from the site, um, fencing it off, baiting, um, ensuring that the tarp is well secured. All of the above prevent vermin being attracted to the site, being attracted to the grain, and in turn stops stops holes, stops the insects getting in, stops the moisture getting in. Looking at pest management in, in bags and bunkers, hygiene and structural treatments, absolutely possible and, and really important. Aeration cooling in bags hasn't been tested in bunkers is possible, um, and, and very possible, takes a bit of setting up, but is possible um, and worthwhile if you're looking at longer term storage in particular. Protectants are, are a very viable option in, in um, temporary storages to give you a bit, a, bit extra um, assurity. Monitoring um, is important and, and obviously that requires figuring out a way to do the monitoring successfully. Pest control comes down to fumigation. Can you get that bunker or that bag sealed to maintain the gas levels you need? Ideally, if we're going to fumigate in a bag or a bunker, we need gas monitoring lines to determine whether we're actually achieving the gas levels that we need to. Um, because we can't do a pressure test on them, we need another way to check that we're gonna get those right gas levels to, to tell us whether we're actually killing the whole life cycle and getting a successful kill and not adding to our, our resistance issues. Key points for temporary storage, um, the preparation, make sure we get a good result. So it, it's really coming down to preparation. I'd encourage you to spend the time there. Um, be realistic about our expectations for temporary storage. The more we put into them in terms of effort and, and management, the better the result will be. Um, be realistic about how long we plan to store in those, those storages. Um, if we're looking at longer term, 
we, we really need to look after those, those storage as well. Um, we'd suggest the, the temporary storages, the longer you hold grain in there, the greater the chance of, of, um, of insect infestation and issues. So um, hence why we call them more temporary top storages. Um, planning ahead, having a plan for, for what you're going to do when you do get an issue, when you do get insects um, in those, those storages. Have you got permanent upright storage you can transfer grain to uh, to be able to deal with any issues that you need to? Again, I'll put those resources uh, on the screen that I spoke about earlier, but are there any other questions that I can help you guys with today? Yeah, just one, Chris. With um, thermal fumigation, installing a PVC up the side of your silo, yeah. is that um, a viable thing to do? Is there, does that work or not worry about it? What's it can I ask? What's the size silos you're talking about? Uh, like a 30 tonne coatser. Oh, yeah, 30 tonne. Um, great question. There's a lot of silos coming out now with those thermo siphons on them. The primary... The primary thing we need for, for successful fumigation is a sealed gas tight silo. So that's number one. It doesn't matter anything else after that. If it's not, if it's not gas tight sealable, your fumigation is not going to work. Then we start looking at recirculation. The research shows that gas will actually travel in any direction through the grain at about six metres per day. So if your silo happened to be six metres tall, it will take about one day for the phosphine to get from the headspace down to the bottom of the grain. So what you would try and do with those thermosiphons or with a recirculation system is move the gas through the silo in a shorter amount of time at the start of your fumigation. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't affect your fumigation time significantly, but it might take it from a, uh, a, a maybe an eight-day fumigation back to a seven-day fumigation. We're not talking about making it from a 10 day to a two day. It's not going to make that much difference. What we'd suggest is that those, those thermosiphons or any recirculation is really only warranted once we're over 100 tonne storage capacity. Once you get over 100 tonne, you're well over six metres and you do start to move that gas around um, more efficiently, um, particularly the bigger flat bottom silos. Then you then you need more than the passive thermosiphon, you need actually powered recirculation. So um, roundabout answer for your question, the size has got to be gas tight seal for a start. Um, thermosiphon not going to give you a huge effect and I certainly wouldn't want that thermosiphon to compromise the seal of the silo in the future. Um, for a 30 tonne silo, uh, I wouldn't bother is the, is the short answer. Um, your phosphine will actually disperse through that grain quickly enough without having a thermosiphon on it. Does that answer your question? Yep, that was perfect. The, the, the other reason people do put thermosiphons on that I will mention is that it might allow you to put the phosphine in at, a, at, a, at the ground level in a, a little chamber um, without having to get to the top of the silo. If you do that, make sure the thermosiphon is of a decent sized pipe, like a hundred mil pipe, and that it's got access into the bottom of the silo and into the head space. So that as that phosphine liberates in the, in the chamber, it's got a decent amount of um, uh, volume of air in that pipe that it can actually um, disperse into so that you don't have phosphine um, liberating in a confined space. That, that can be dangerous. Any other questions? No questions from me, Chris. That was really good. Enjoyed that. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Graham. Thanks for your questions and, and for your input. Um, and thanks, Todd, for your questions and your input as well. Uh, and, and likewise, Matt. Appreciate you your logging in today um, with your busy, busy schedules. Um, remember those resources if you do need more information, they're readily available. Um, I hope you have a good harvest this year and thank you to the JLSC um, who, who manage grower levies to, to enable these, uh, these webinars and workshops and thank you to FarmLink for hosting today um, and, and making these resources available to, to the FarmLink members and for Matt for, for organising it for us today. Thanks once again.
Thank you, Chris, for doing that. That's fantastic. Um, this will be recorded. So if you want to look back at it at a later date, um, we also have hard copies of a lot of the, um, the stored grain materials. So if you want any of those, feel free to reach out. Thanks, Matt. Well, uh, all the best for harvest and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks, everyone.